Hey everybody, welcome to this, my second of two videos on the Bell & Howell Auto 35 Solidus Reflex QL, also called the Canon EX-EE. First thing that we're gonna do with this camera, first video looked at all of the buttons and things and what they were. In this video, we're gonna talk about how to do everything with them. First thing we're gonna do is change the battery so that we can actually use this camera. And we're going to take the battery cap off here. This uses a two single, single, um, yeah, one of the old 1.35 volt mercury batteries that are no longer made. You can get a zinc air battery for them and uh, those will work. They don't last all that long, but they work. You can also get a voltage adapting battery adapter like this one right here. And there you can see the voltage adapting battery adapter up close. There we go. These are about 30 to $40 a piece and they're very easy to, easy to lose, so they're not my favorite option. You can also get one of these simple brass adapters. These are dumb adapters that do not adjust the voltage, and if you use one of these, I'll show you how to compensate for them. I also took the base plate off of this to check it out, check out how easy it would be to modify the circuitry, and it looks like it should be fairly easy. I think, if I remember correctly, I took off the base plates of a bunch of cameras one night to check that out. I think this was one of the ones that looked like it would be fairly easy. So at any rate, oh, and if you use the standard, the modern batteries, which look about like this, um, then you will still have to adapt the voltage because the modern batteries that are the right size for this are the same voltage as these small button cells, which is 1.5 volts, and that will throw off your metering. So you can see there that might be able to see that at one point a battery had leaked inside of this. And I, was, I cleaned most of it out, but there are some stubborn bits that corroded the contact. So this, this camera's electronics are a bit tenchy and um, sometimes this camera works, sometimes it doesn't. So we'll see if it's having a good night tonight. So to put the battery in, you just drop it in with the positive terminal facing you. And then we're going to screw the the battery cap on. This should go on very easily. If it puts up a resistance, you want to back it out and then put it back in again because you don't want to cross thread this, which can can cause the camera to have issues um, like not being able to get the battery cap back off or stripping the threads and not being able to use it at all. So if you use a voltage adapting battery adapter, you can see there how the battery chain, the battery cap does not sit flush with the base of the camera. That's just part and parcel to using one of the um, voltage adapting battery adapters. So the next thing that we're gonna do is we're going to load and unload. We're gonna load film in this camera next because um, the lens thing, which is normally the second thing we do, requires a bit of an understanding about how the ISO dial works before we talk about it. To load your camera, you need to open up the back this should just be able to pull up on the knob. This knob is not superbly designed it because it's wider at the base, which makes it really hard. You've got to have a good grip to pull up on it. So this is not something I recommend doing on most cameras, but I find it easier to flip the rewind lever up, get it started, and then finish like that. Um, you got to be careful with that. You don't want to put too much stress on that hinge lest it break. We're gonna take our film and we're gonna drop it into the film cassette chamber. We're gonna pull out a leader and we're gonna set it, oh, come on, cooperate. Oh, come on. This film has so much memory because it's ancient that um, it does not wanna lay flat. Let's see if I can trick it into laying flat. Probably not, but we'll, we'll give it a go. So you wanna pull out a leader and bring out the end of the leader to where this red indicator is. Come on. All right, and you can see there that the film is in fact um, engaging the sprockets like it's supposed to. Close the film back, take out the tension. Now we're going to advance three frames and watch the film rewind knob here. I'll flip the lever out to make it easier to see. If it's being taken up, this spins, right? So it's not spinning, that tells us that the film is not being taken up on the inside. And that it's a little bit cracked now because this film is ancient. This film, this film honestly, it's from literally this, this cassette of film is from the 80s. 
It expired in the mid 80s and that makes it a challenge today. There we go. Let's see. All right, let's see if we can get it to work this time. All right, it's gonna work. So to make it easier to see, I'm gonna flip the lever out. And you can see how this is moving as we advance the film and it's moving in the opposite direction of the rewind directional arrow right there. Oh, God, it's so shiny when I don't have my fingerprints all over it. Okay, there we go. Now the next thing we're gonna do is we have the 50 millimeter lens on here. So we're going to look at that 1.8 in the ASA, they call it. ASA stood for American Standards Association. And when ASA stopped rating films, ISO took over. Um, if you ever hear a lot of Americans and Brits say ISO, the reason is because for the entirety of film until the late 90s, I think it was, it was ASA, so it's, it just sticks in your brain that it's an acronym. So anyway, so we put in 200 ISO film, we're going to adjust this until the 200 is over the 18 because we have the 1.8 50 millimeter lens in. And now we know we're gonna get proper metering. So to use the electric eye, all you have to do is set your shutter speed, set this to EE, set your shutter speed, and then your camera will give you the proper aperture. Maybe. In theory, the, uh, the ISO goes over the 1.8 when you have the 50 millimeter on. If you have one of the other lenses, the 35, the 90, or the 125 on, then what you need to do is adjust the ISO to being over here at the F3.5 setting, okay? And then if you switch back to the 50, you have to remember to adjust this back to 1.8. It's one of the downsides of this system. It's a little bit frustrating, but that's, that's okay. Now, typically this is the part of the video where I tell you don't open the film back, it'll ruin your film, it's one and done. All of that is true. Don't open your film back until you rewind your film. But um, I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to show you very much because of the quick load system. I guess we'll find out. So remember, film is one and done, so if you open your film back like I just did during your roll, you will ruin your images. But I think it's important for you to see how film travels through your camera. So after you take your picture, you activate your shutter and then your, you advance the film and then the good film is pulled out of the cassette to have the next photo taken and then the film that's had the photo taken is taken up on the uh, take up spool over here just like that and then when you're done you hold down the film rewind button and then you rewind the film and again remember your your film bag has to be closed until you completely rewind the film And I'm gonna leave a little bit of leader out so I can use this again for a few more videos tonight. There we go. And then you take out your roll of film and then grab your next roll of film and pop it in if you're gonna take more photos or if you're done for the day. Close your film back, make sure your shutter's been triggered and set your camera off to rest for the night. So now that we know how to use the ISO dial for the, len uh, for the lens adjustment, I'm going to show you how to swap out the lenses. All you have to do is unscrew counterclockwise the lens. Now you can see this threaded bit right here is what connects to the, the threads inside of this, this chamber. This is, and so far as I know, this is proprietary and there were no other lens options made for this camera and only the four that were made by Canon exist. I'm not even sure what diameter or thread pitch this is. It looks like a coarse thread though and it looks like it's got a pretty gracious thread pitch. So I don't even know if there's a way to use this camera to experiment with other lenses or not because I'm not sure you could get something else that would screw into this. That's a pretty small opening right there. So then what you want to do is you want to grab your other lens if you have the 35, then it shares lens caps with the 50. The other lenses don't do that. The rear lens caps are the same across the spectrum of them. Then just take this guy and screw it in. There we go. Put the lens cap onto the one that you just took off. And set him in your pocket or camera bag or whatever. And now let's see if we can figure out how the focusing scale works because the focusing scale is still for the 50. And insofar as I can tell, what you need to do is focus this lens here, okay? 
And when you get something in focus, if you want to use the focusing scales, let's say you're at three meters, which is 10 feet, then you line this three meters, which is 10 feet up here, with this imaginary line that connects these two right there. And then the focusing scales indicate what's going to be in focus. I can't see any other reason why this would spin freely and how any other way that this, this, focusing, this set of focusing scales makes sense. If you want to shoot in hyperfocal distance, uh, the way I think that works is that you line up this infinity with this 16's line, which cuts in a little bit. There we go. And that 16's line indicates uh, it lines up with that five, which means that you'd need to focus to 10 feet like that to get hyperfocal distance with this lens. I think it makes sense, but um, I haven't been able to validate that in the field yet. So the, the, the big thing to keep in mind with these lenses is once you mount one that is not the 50, you've got to adjust your ISO dial. So we've just mounted the lens. We've got to adjust the ISO dial to make sure that our film speed is lined up with the 3.5, which it is because I forgot to undo it before. And then the focusing scales on the lens and focus ring do not apply to your lens unless you have the 50 millimeter in. This is one of those things that it's an inexpensive system. And because it's an inexpensive system, some of the niceties have been sacrificed. That's one of them, is having separate focusing scales for each lens to be able to do hyperfocal or zone focal, zone focus focusing with each of the lenses. Still a super solid and fun to use camera though. So let's talk about using a flash on the EXEE. There is no hot shoe right here. So if you're going to use a flash, you're going to have, you, you can mount it here, but you it won't be triggered by the shutter. There's a PC port on the side, so any flash you use has to have a PC cable connection so that your flash can connect here. That's what's gonna trigger your flash. So if you put a flash on your camera, it needs to have a cable that connects to the flash port there. Let's, let's talk a little bit about some flash technique and hold your head sideways, it won't be awkward at all. Let's say that you have a flash on your camera, right? Let's pretend this is your flash. And it's connected to the PC port. You take your picture and the flash triggers. The light's gonna come out of the flash, it's gonna reach your subject, and it's gonna bounce back down off of your subjects to your lens. And your subjects are going to look waxy and flat like mannequins or worse. And that's because of the way that people and any subject looks when the the light goes up and back in a very simple pattern. The easiest way to do to fix this is if you have a lens that articulates, make sure that the lens is focused, is articulating in some direction other than straight forward. We see people and other things lit from above, right? That's just how we're used to seeing them because we walk under the sun or under overhead lights. And if you've ever seen a film noir movie, one of the ways that film noir directors indicated a person was a villain was by lighting them from below. If you want to give people the most flattering light possible, you want to have that light bouncing off of a ceiling or a uh, reflector. If you're just starting out, a ceiling's gonna be easy to do. You wanna have the light go up from your camera, hit, hit the ceiling, come back down, and then the light that's bounced off the ceiling will reflect back from your subject to your lens. And that's gonna give you much more flattering lighting for your subjects that's softer, that's more natural, and it's gonna be just a better way of taking photos of any subject. When you use a flash on this camera, you wanna make sure that you're set to 1 60th of a second or slower. Now, the reason for that is that this camera has a focal plane shutter. And what that means is let's, the way that a focal plane shutter works is that you have two curtains. One opens and exposes the film to light and then the other one closes, and then when you advance the film, they reset. You don't get faster shutter speeds by the curtains physically moving faster. You get them because the gap between them is different. Your shutter curtains will always move at the same speed across the film plane, regardless of what shutter speed you're set at. So let's say you're set to 1 60th, which is your flash sync speed. The first curtain's going to open, your entire film plane will be exposed to light for, in Nero's makes no difference, 1 60th of a second. And then the second curtain will close behind it, and then you advance. Well, what if you set it to 1 8th? 
your first curtain opens, your entire film plane is exposed to light for, in rough terms, an eighth of a second. And then the second curtain closes and you advance like that. But if you're at 1 500th, that's when things start to get different. Well, actually at 1 125th, things start to get different. At 1 500th, they're very different. At 1 125th, 1 250th, and 1 500th, your first curtain opens, and then at some point while it's still traveling, the second curtain comes up behind it, right? So you're not getting faster shutter speeds by these moving faster, you're getting faster shutter speeds by having a, a narrower or a wider gap between your first and second shutter. So if you're at 1 500th, your flash might trigger right about here, and what's between my hands would be illuminated, but what's behind my hands would be dark because the light w from the flash would be blocked by the shutter curtains. And then we'll continue on, and so your image with a flash photo taken faster than 1 60th would just be a strip of light um, going down some part of the frame where the, when the flash was triggered in the middle of the exposure. So let's put everything that we've learned together and see how to take a picture with this camera. And then we will, um, I'll show you how to do double exposures with this camera because quick load system cameras have a different method for taking double exposures and it's a little bit wonky. But first, a standard exposure. So we're gonna do one in, in EE mode first. So just set it to EE, make sure that your ISO is set correctly, whether it's 1.8 or 3.5. Then what you want to do is pick the shutter speed that you would like. That also gives you an aperture that you would like. Focus. Pretend that the film was already advanced. Take your picture. And you're set. That's, that's how you take a picture in EE mode. Then you advance and you're ready to take the next one. In manual mode, you want to pick whatever aperture you would like. The meter is not going to tell you in this. You can take a reading with EE mode and then manually compensate, as well as whatever shutter speed you'd like. Focus, of course, and then take your picture. Now, in this camera, manual mode can be really useful. Let's say the EE mode tells you that at 1 1 25th, it's going to give you an f5.6 aperture. Okay. Well, I don't want f5.6. I'm taking pictures of water coming down some glistening, some rocks in the sun. And I want those rocks to be dark and I want the water to still have some highlights. So actually I want it to be F8, maybe F11, okay? The um, EE is gonna tell me how to get an exposure so that those rocks are mid-tone. But I want the rocks to be dark, which is why I'm going to use a smaller aperture. So I'm gonna take a picture. And that's how you can use EE mode to get a meter reading and then to use the manual shutter, uh, manual aperture rather, to get a different creative result. One thing to note is that if your camera is dead, if the battery is dead or the circuitry is shot and your EE mode does not work, the manual aperture settings still work so you can still use this camera with a handheld light meter or using the Sunny 16 rule. So let's talk about double exposures with this camera, which are not easy. The quick load system is awesome for loading film, terrible for double exposures. So let me explain the science behind double exposures first, okay? If your camera says at 1 1 25th of a second, f5.6 is the correct aperture, and you take a picture, it's properly exposed. Well, if you take two pictures on that same frame, it's way overexposed. If you scan it, you're going to get digital artifacts that you don't want. If you print it, it's going to be a lot harder to print. It's going to reduce your overall contrast and just in general give you lower quality image results. So when you double expose, you want to reduce the light in each exposure by half. That means that if you're at 1 1 25th of a second in f5.6, then your actual shutter speed should be... If you guessed 1 to 250th, you would be correct. And the reason is because these are fractions, so the higher number is shorter, the lower number is longer. So 1 60th of a second is twice as long as 1 1 25th. Back of napkin, twice as long. And 1 2 50th is actually half as long as 1 1 25th. Okay, so taking a double exposure means you have to take two images that are half exposed. So the first thing we're going to do is talk about the mechanics of how to do it 
and then we're going to talk about how to do it in automatic mode. So with most cameras, you take a double exposure by taking your first photo, holding down the film rewind button, holding down the film rewind lever, and then advancing. If you did that with actual film in your camera, you would damage something, either the film or the camera. And the reason for that is because of the quick load system. You can see this, this has a rubber foot on it here, and this sandwiches the film there. And even if I hold the rewind button, that still advances, which means that that is going to pull on that film whether this is spe free spinning or not. So if this is a, so if you try to do a double exposure the standard way, you will jack something up, probably your film, which means you're going to have to rewind your entire film wherever you are in the roll because uh, and, and you'll risk damaging your camera. So what you need to do to do a double exposure is rewind your film between the frames. So what that looks like is this. We're going to take some film and load it in here. All right, get some of it advanced here. So what you want to do is make sure that you don't have any slack in your film and then you're going to take, you're going to get your settings set so that you're going to have a, a half exposure. Take your picture. Now, what I recommend doing is flipping out this rewind lever because this will make it easier to figure out where your camera actually, where your rewind lever actually is. You can do a couple of different things. If your rewind lever is here, that's kind of useless actually. Let's set up the 16 to align with that rewind lever, okay? We're gonna advance our film. Now we have to rewind it. I'm gonna hold down the film rewind button and we're going to rewind until we bring it back around and there we go. We're realigned with the 16. Take our second photo and move on. Now you'll notice this did not advance as far the second time as it did the first. The first time it advanced almost 270 degrees. This time it advanced about 180. So what you need to do is put on the lens cap, make sure you are not in EE mode for this one, and take a photo. You need to take a dead frame, otherwise you risk your, or you will get your, your frame after the double exposure overlapping. And that's because when, when the, the film moves after a double exposure, it's not moving the whole frame, only part of the frame. So then this part of the frame here is still in the image area when the next photo is taken and you'll have ruined all your hard work with the double exposure. With this camera and with, as far as I know, all of the quick load cameras, you have to rewind the film to the proper position when um, you are doing your double exposure. So let's say you're in, in manual mode. Doing a double exposure is super easy. 1 1 25th and F5 6, okay. There, now we've got our two double exposures that we're gonna take, okay? Or leave it at 1 1 25th and close down a stop, whatever works best for you creatively. If you're going to be in EE mode, you need to trick the camera. So let's say we have the 50 millimeter lens on, we're in EE mode, that says 400 ISO, it says 800 ISO, we can't do it. Let's go back to 200 ISO on the F1.8, okay? We have to get, trick the camera into giving the film half as much light as it needs. 200 ISO is twice as fast as, you guessed it, 400. 400 film requires half as much light as 200. So in EE mode, we're going to adjust the ISO dial to 400 or up one stop specifically from the, uh, the correct ISO to get the camera to receive half, or the film to receive half as much light as it should during the double exposure. Then we're gonna do our double exposure process and we're set to go. Um, the amount that this will have to be re rewound after your, your first exposure will vary by how far along you are in the roll. It will have to be rewound less early on in the roll than at the end where it will have to be re rewound more and that's because the diameter of the film on the spool reduces as the film is transferred from the cassette to the other side of the camera. Last thing that we're going to talk about here is how to use batteries other than the zinc air which have the correct voltage and the mercury cells which aren't sold in the US at least and I don't think most of 
the world anymore. What you want to do if you have a dumb adapter or one of the modern batteries with the incorrect voltage is put it in and then let's say you're using uh, I don't know, let's say you've got, again, 200 ISO film, okay? When you have, when go out, so on a sunny day, go outside with the sun to your back, set the shutter speed to 1 to 50th, and your manual aperture to, I'm sorry, your uh, EE to, your, your aperture to EE, put the sun to your back and take a, and, and look through the viewfinder at something in full sun, and now you want to adjust your ISO dial until your, needle says 16. There's this thing called the sunny 16 rule, which says at F16, your shutter speed should be the number closest to your film speed. So if you have 200, uh, 200 ISO film, 1 2 50th is the closest. And so what you want to do is trick the camera into thinking that you, it trick the camera into giving you a correct meter reading by adjusting the ISO to compensate for the different battery voltage. Now, my camera did not like the voltage adapting adapter. In fact, the meter wouldn't turn on with it. So, if the the other thing you can do is of course use the voltage adapting adapters, but those might or might not work or you can have someone modify the circuitry with a resistor, which um, will allow modern batteries to work correctly without any compensation. So those are your options for metering with this camera, and that is it. That is the second video on this, the, the Canon EXEE, also called the Bell & Howell Auto 35 Solidus Reflex QL. So if this video was helpful and informative, please give me a thumbs up. That lets me know that I'm producing content which is useful and helpful to you. If you have any questions or concerns or thoughts or suggestions, please leave those below. I check comments about every other day. And uh, if, you have, if you're an amateur photographer who's taken photos with an EXEE, please feel free to share a link to your work. I always enjoy seeing what other people do with these cameras. One last thing, thank you everyone for watching, and I'll see you in the next video series.